We're at the southern end of the beach now. Pasky's jumped in the rock pool. He's hunting. <laughs> let's, let's, have a, let's have a look how she's going. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30-foot, 50-year-old sailing boat, Marool. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. Never miss an episode of Free Range Sailing again. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button to stay notified of all our upcoming releases. We spent a few days of strong winds and rain hiding inside Bathurst Harbour, but with the weather clearing, we decided to take Marul out of the harbour to anchor in Spain Bay, where we could walk across and visit Stevens Bay. So I'm not stamping on the ground for fun. Um, this all looks pretty swampy and nesty, so there could be a few snakes around. But snakes are most dangerous if you catch them by surprise. So giving them a bit of a... Just let them know we're coming. They can't hear that well, but they can definitely feel through the ground. And we've gone through some very snaky parts of Australia. And I mean, we can spot the sightings on, well, mine and Pascal's one hand, I guess. So you can see as we're walking through here, Looks like pretty snaky country. I think if I was a tiger snake, I wouldn't mind living in here, looking for some frogs and things like that. <laughs> Taking your time. And we can see the object of this walk ahead of us. Looks like wombat tracks. Our marsupial poos are squarish. They're cubed off. And as is often the case with human tracks, the local animals like using them as well. And they, they, they do a bit to keep them open. So if you look here, you can see there's some nice little really well defined wombat tracks. So if you're going to come to this part of Tassie <laughs> and you want to wear shoes, you're going to have to bring your own gum boots. Or you're going to have to enjoy wet socks. Pascal being very intrepid. Someone else came through before and cleared the snake, so we can send Pascal first now. Usually I'm on spiderweb duty and snake duty, but now I've, now we've popped Pascal in front so she can just find the mud holes for us. Gage, mm, just a bit over ankle deep. Well, this makes for a nice change of pace. It's like we're on a form track again. It's beautiful. You can hear the, hear the waves crashing there. You can tell this place gets three metres of rain a year. For you fellow soil enthusiasts, have a look at this. So here's, uh, here's a really big midden site to Aboriginals, maybe even a few white fellas added to it, who knows? But people have been coming here and getting a pretty big seafood feed for a long, long time. Some of these shells look like they've only just, just been put here. We're at the southern end of the beach now. 
Husky's jumped in the rock pool. She's hunting. But all those middens there, they sort of indicate that there must be something living in these rock pools. <laughs> let's, let's, have a, let's have a look how she's going. A very light lunch is served. <laughs> we only got one crayfish yesterday. So I boiled up the tail last night and then put it in the fridge to chill ready for lunch today because we love having it cold. And I've just done some salted radish and um, made some lemon mayo. Mm. Pretty good. Perfectly cooked. Oh, cool. Mm. It was worth the effort. <laughs> yeah, it's worth freezing in the 12 degree water. I didn't, did I? I sat it out. So. I don't even deserve to be eating this delicious lunch. Someone does. <laughs> So while we've got variables in the middle of the day, we've just come out to see if we can catch ourselves a fish. Troy found some variation on the sounder, some different ground on the sounder that had fish on it last time we went past. But it's dead as a maggot this time. But we've had some pretty strong winds and at the moment it's dead calm. The water is pretty crazy. It's, it looks like liquid metal, molten. The other benefit of going on this mission is that we've had really cloudy skies for the last three or four days and we've been in pretty sheltered anchorages so we haven't been able to make much power with the wind generator even though it's been quite windy. So we've just come out and we're running the engine to use the alternator to charge up the battery. So I can do a bit of work this afternoon on the computer, do a bit of editing. So we didn't find any fish arches this morning. And we've decided that we're going to have a look in this brown water and see if we can find something. Might be a little bit spooky. Are you going to be spooked? No. <laughs> Definitely not. I am already terrified from all of us. <laughs> Alright, we're going to get in. See what, see what it's all about in here. He's not too pleased. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but I'm pretty happy. That's My it. second cray is a good one. It was very murky. I did a bit of filming, but you couldn't really see. It was really hard to film us <laughs> getting dark. food. So I just, yeah, I've shown you what it's like down there. Pretty murky. But seeing this guy was easy because he was bright orange and all that kind of browny, greeny kelp. Yeah. And Troy did really well. He got <laughs> a lot of abalone. I didn't see any today. That's the abalone. The abalone were really hard to see. They were under the weed and it was dark water. Yeah. So it took a bit of swimming around, for, but we've got a decent little haul for lunch. So it's not too bad. <laughs> I think for the next few days. Great. All right, I'm going to process these and then we'll get out of here for the wind. Yep. Yeah. Nice. 
Now it's really easy to remove the guts, huh? Yeah. Been a long time coming, but fresh black lip abalone. Hmm. How, how'd you cook them? Cooked in ghee. <laughs> With some salt, some pepper, and some spring onions. Basically, just warmed it up, and it's delicious. Mm. Yum, 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 yum. There's nothing better than a bowl of hot soup on a windy, cold, and rainy day. We had boiled the lobster legs the day before and had set it to chill in the fridge. The hardest part about this dish is spending the time removing all the meat from the legs. Frying the lobster shell in ghee like this makes the most of the lobster flavour, as well as making the resulting stock a beautiful orange colour. After a few minutes, I added a pint of water and then shut the lid on the pressure cooker, turning off the heat after the stock had been at pressure for five minutes. With the base ingredients of finely chopped onion, carrot, potato, lobster meat and lobster stock, it's time to put together the soup. First fry the onion and carrot together with two tablespoons of ghee until the onions are translucent. Add the chopped potato. Then add your prepared stock and simmer for 10 minutes until the potato is cooked. Add a couple of tablespoons of cream, cracked black pepper and two pinches of salt. If you like a bit of spice, you can add half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. I'm doing the final touches now. I'm just adding a few bits of lobster to the actual soup that I just pureed up. And I'm leaving some of the bigger bits from the larger legs to put on top for presentation. I'm just reheating the soup now so it's really, really hot. And I'm also heating the kettle just to warm the bowls because it's really cold right now and I don't want to put hot soup in cold bowls. I love the soup. I already know it's delicious because I was tasting it. Mm. All right, part of cruising around is getting a good weather forecast. Here on the west coast of Tassie, and indeed when we were all through northern Australia, there was no coast stations that were broadcasting on VHF. So we had to rely on HF radio, so high frequency. Now those have a greater range because what they do is they bounce radio signals off the ionosphere and they can go over the horizon, whereas VHF is pretty much line of sight. You don't need an HF radio to receive... HF weather broadcasts. What you can have is just a fairly inexpensive shortwave radio. We use this little thing and it's got SSB and that means it can handle single sideband broadcasts. All right, it's got a little button. That's the important bit. A lot of the time they'll just have this little extendable antenna that you're familiar with. 
good ones like this Texan will also have an external antenna that you can plug in. If it doesn't, if you've got a cheaper um, shortwave radio that you've been gifted or you've already got and you just can't pick up a good signal, what you can do is get a length of wire preferably over 10 meters okay secure it somewhere on your boat you can even pull it up with a halyard and on the other end if you've got an alligator clip you can just clip it straight to there and that will be effective but um, a lot of the ones like this little texan here they've got a plug-in antenna so you can just clip that outside um, plug it in and it ex it's extends the antenna you can get a lot more range with it what you can do before you leave is most of your um, meteorological bureaus They'll publish the times and the frequencies, and they will change depending on the day or night, um, the frequencies that you'll be able to pick up a weather schedule. So with this one at the moment, I know that our area is broadcasting right now. Less than 1 to 1.5 metres, decreasing to around 1 metre during the morning. So you can hear that that's pretty rough. Lower east coast, wind glass bay to Tasman Island. But it's enough for us to hear, okay, on this cheap little unit. And admittedly, some of the HF um, tuners, they can do a bit better performance, particularly if the antenna and the tuner is really well matched and a high quality bit of gear. But you're talking about thousands of dollars instead of just a couple hundred. What you'll normally get on a single sideband radio is you've got your main tuning dial here, which is sort of like gross tuning, and that'll select all the stations. And then once you've selected a station, you've got another little, another little fine tuner here. All right, so, and you can hear this. Do you like chipmunks? A normal voice? Or talking to the underworld? All right, so that's enough that we can get the forecast. And of course, they, all, they also pick up um, FM and AM radio, if, you, if that's your thing. When we're going to sea, that is definitely part of our safety kit. A shortwave radio. Wind, variable, around 10 knots, becoming east to northeast wind, 5 to 15 knots in the east. 5 to 15. Okay, so we got our weather forecast. If we can get two weather schedules, like we'll get the one of a night time and then try and get one midday, which it is now, and we can just see and we can make adjustments. Most of the time, the weather, the weather within one or two days, they're reasonably accurate. Okay, once it gets out to three to five days, it starts to slip and anything beyond that is pretty much fantasy we found. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easily 60 to 70% incorrect. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so... Um, and look, that's not the that's not the weather guy's fault. It, there's so many variables in the weather. It, it's such a complex system. I, you know, like I don't know. Trying to predict the weather, <laughs> I think it's a real art form. Next week, the cold and wet weather drives us out of Port Davy and on to new places for some more free ranging. Thanks for joining us this week and if you enjoyed the video please hit the thumbs up button as it really helps promote our channel to a broader audience. We look forward to seeing you next week for more Tasmanian adventures. Bye for now.